Hello everyone, my name is Martina. I will moderate today. And also so glad to welcome everyone here. Today uh, we'll represent Fatima Manapekova and Altnay Adopaeva. Please can start it. Thanks, Medina. It's nice to see familiar names here <laughs> watching us. Thank you so much for this opportunity uh, to be able to share our project uh, with you and with the Snow Leopard community, Snow Leopard Network community. Uh, today, we've been invited to speak about building conservation capacity and partnerships with, Osh, uh, with communities in Osh Oblast in Kyrgyzstan. Our project uh, went from 2021 to 2022. Uh, let us tell you a little bit about ourselves. Uh, my name is Fatima Manabekova. My background is in human geography. Uh, I got connected to the snow leopard conservation um, work through uh, working in building curriculums for the University of Central Asia, uh, where that's where I met our now partner in Tajikistan, Kobol John Shakirov. And with him and with the Panthera team, we were able to apply for a grant and start this project. And that's how I joined and I'm excited to be here. Uh, and hi everyone, I'm Altinai. Um, happy to be here too. I am uh, originally from Kyrgyzstan, uh, but I've been living in Germany for the uh, last few years. And my background is in um, economics and data analytics, in fact. And I got into this project also uh, similar to Fatima through Kobul John Shakirov. Um, yeah, and last uh, few years, being involved in this project uh, was really great learnings for me um, for in, in terms of wildlife conservation. So uh, thanks SLN for providing this um, platform for knowledge exchange. Um, and thanks for being here with us. Yeah, thanks everyone. Uh, we're gonna tell you a bit about um, the scope and uh, how we got to our project. Um, this location, Osh region in Kyrgyzstan, is part of the Pamir Alai Mountains. Um, we worked closely with our local partners, Ilbir's Foundation. Without them, this project wouldn't have been possible. I see that Kenja is watching us as well. She was part of our project uh, and she contributed a lot to the success of how the surveys went. Um, and another local partner we had was uh, Camp Palato. They work in natural resource management on a community level in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, and our funding uh, came from two sources, one of which is the Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund. And the second one was Panthera's uh, Sabin Snow Leopard Grants. Why this location, um, Osh Oblast? Um, we wanted to see and collect data on local populations, distributions, and threats to species in Pamir Align Mountains. Um, we thought that it's crucial information to prioritize and tailor conservation efforts. And because it's a transboundary location, it serves as a significant corridor linking otherwise isolated snow leopard populations to the West in Uzbekistan and Tajikistan and also to China. Uh, there is a lot of migratory species that go back and forth from these areas. And much of this work has been unmonitored uh, throughout the years. So, um, we decided to create a baseline understanding of where everything is. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so on the map, uh, Osh Oblast, uh, for those that don't know, is located in, in the southern uh, western part of Kyrgyzstan. Originally, our project was meant to be in Batken province, Batken Oblast. Uh, however, due to the uh, conflicts in Batkan and uh, for security reasons, we decided to move the project to Osh uh, and we focused on four 
districts in Osh, Chongalai, Nukat, Alai, and Karakulja, uh, because they fall inside the Pamir Alai Mountains. Um, we wanted to conduct baseline research and we wanted it to include human wildlife conflict, illegal hunting, wildlife sightings, um, the potential for tourism in these areas, attitudes of communities towards conservation and much more uh, as well. Uh, and to do this, we decided to split the survey, not, not to have only one, but two different ones. Uh, first one being the occupancy survey, second one being the household survey, and they were uh, separately designed uh, for different um, surveys and to examine different areas of research. Um, so the household surveys, uh, the research goals were focused on socioeconomic situation, human wildlife conflict, policy awareness, poaching, and tourism. And um, kind of the targeted group for this survey were the general village members, um, community members, housewives, maybe youth, village councils, veterinarians, and so on. And the occupancy survey, on the other hand, the goal was um, more focused on establishing reliable, specific knowledge of snow leopards and other species distributions, how they interact with people and threats. And the targeted group uh, for this survey were hunters, herders, rangers, and other um, mountain experts in, in the villages. We divided the project into four phases. The first phase being introductory visits. Second phase or were the survey visits. Third phase was the survey analysis and fourth phase were the seminars. So in the first phase, uh, we decided to do an initial introductory visit because we were not familiar with the area. And uh, we created a survey based off of the Tajikistan surveys uh, that were done earlier. And uh, we designed the, the occupancy and household surveys. Uh, we received training from our Tajikistan partners. Then we arrived in Alai uh, and we met with rangers. We held three seminars in uh, Saratash, Saramagul, and Taldusu villages and received feedback on these surveys. We also went uh, door to door and conducted test surveys. Some of the challenges we encountered already were that ideas and concepts didn't translate the same way from English to Kyrgyz. And I'm wondering from just our viewers, if you've encountered this kind of challenges in your work, uh, if you have, please send the thumbs up. In phase two, we went uh, for survey visits. Um, so this is when we redesigned the surveys based off of the introductory visits. We hired more surveyors, we held trainings for them and created a rough transportation route. Uh, at this time, we visited 40 villages in four uh, mentioned districts in Osh Oblast. Uh, and the methodology was to keep a 15 kilometer distance between each survey location. And when we arrived in each location, we first uh, went to the village head, introduced our project, received uh, consent for our survey work, and uh, we asked them to show us the way towards the hunters, herders, and more of the targeted populations regarding um, uh, wildlife sightings. And for the household surveys, we just went around and knocked door to door. And this uh, lasted for 23 days the collection period. And within that period, the occupancy survey was adjusted once more. Uh, one of the biggest challenges here was that uh, in, the transport in the transport route, not all villages were on the map. So we asked uh, nearby villages for directions. And we also found that in Kyrgyzstan, some villages even had different names uh, than they were mapped. Thanks, Fatima. So 
Um, let's now jump into the phase three, the survey analysis. And let me just uh, give you a glimpse of some of the uh, results that we have so far from our survey study. Like Fatima said, there have been two types of survey, the occupancy and the households. And while the occupancy part is still being analyzed by our colleague Shannon from Pantera, uh, we just wanted to still give you a little uh, glimpse of um, the first uh, findings. Uh, Shannon is basically working on the multi-species occupancy model and the uh, distribution of uh, snow leopards and other wildlife uh, from this uh, occupancy service that we have been um, collecting. And here in this table, you can see uh, some of the wildlife um, species um, and uh, the unique uh, observations detecting those species and where uh, the unique sites, the locations uh, where uh, the detection has been uh, spotted. And uh, for snow leopards, we had uh, 31 uh, unique observers um, who said they've seen snow leopard in 29 um, sites. And for example, um, for uh, lynx, there have been also pretty a lot of sightings um, for the fox and wolf. Um, yeah, what might be interesting, the jackal and doe. Um, so actually in our survey, we have been asking, we have been showing pictures of all those species and asking the experts, the hunters and rangers, uh, yeah, which animal they identify this uh, species on the picture. And uh, with the doll, it was really confusing because uh, many have been um, confusing it with jackals. So uh, yeah, that's then it was decided to unite uh, this um, respondent, uh, respondent uh, uh, sightings. Uh, so there are 43 cases uh, in 30 unique sites. Also, there have been a few uh, uh, observers that said they have seen a palace cat and wild cat, which is interesting, and some bear uh, sightings, mostly in Karakuja and Chongalai. Yeah, um, I'm sure Shannon is going to share the results of his uh, uh, of his study uh, with the community soon. Uh, but uh, let me give a bit more detail uh, analysis, the results of the analysis on the household part. Um, so Fatima also already mentioned that one of the main uh, goals of the household survey part was uh, to know uh, the human wildlife conflict, what are the links, uh, what are, uh, what is, uh, if there are any predator attacks on the household livestock. And we have been asking in our surveys um, to, uh, for people to um, focus on last two years, so 2019 uh, to 2021 is basically the reporting period for this part. And um, yeah, so some of the main findings here um, is that 57% uh, uh, of all the um, uh, respondents of the households that we've interviewed, uh, they have uh, reported um, predator attacks on um, their livestock. And here it's important to mention that we count uh, this as um, the household attacks with at least one livestock loss uh, because there have been many more um, cases reported where no livestock, uh, with no livestock loss. Uh, so probably with uh, the other uh, metric that would be around 65% and yeah. Uh, then, on average, um, around four livestock loss. Um, every on average, um, a household would lose uh, four livestock, four animals, uh, during those predator attacks. And um, and uh, what was also interesting for us is uh, to know if people report uh, those cases to some relevant agency. 
um, maybe to village council or to the hunter association. And uh, we found out then that in less than half, so in 40% of cases, people do report uh, the uh, cases of the predator attacks on livestock. Um, yeah, which is pretty low. And also we have found out uh, while talking to the village councils, uh, to the rangers that mostly people uh, report it uh, when uh, there is wolf attack, for example, and they ask a village council to send someone, uh, some hunter with a license uh, that could uh, kill the wolf. But, uh, actually the data is not really being tracked um, by, the, by the agencies, by any agency. Um, yeah, so what you can see here also is the, um, the household attack. So the links uh, by predator species um, of the livestock losses and the predators. Um, as you can see, majority of attacks is done by wolves and then also followed by jackals, foxes. Um, few cases where lynx was um, attacking uh, is linked to the household attacks uh, and the bears. And here it's important to mention that, um, yeah, that we have to take into consideration the human factor. And of course, like people tend to overestimate the losses and also not always people might have actually seen uh, the attacks. Um, they might assume uh, that they've seen the predator, but in some cases, um, like in, just in very few cases, people said they don't know who was the predator, uh, but most uh, in many cases they, like we're sure um, that uh, who was the predator. Yeah, and so we just need to be careful with interpretation um, of the results. Yeah, and uh, regarding the location of the, the place of the attacks, most of them happen in open pastures. Um, yeah, and also some in barns and corals in backyard and pastures. In 6% uh, of cases, people reported attacks, but they didn't report on the location. And uh, yeah, how, how do respondents uh, protect their livestock? Uh, as you can see here, um, mostly people protect their livestock with barns and corals. And this is, uh, there is similar uh, tendencies across all the four districts that we have interviewed. Um, yeah, and also uh, flat trees and dogs. So people use all possible types of protection um, that is available to them. Um, yeah, some use lightings in the night, but considering the electricity problems, um, it's quite few people that do this. And what was interesting to know the scarecrows uh yeah the people actually do the scarecrows and uh people really get creative in the way they uh construct them yeah that was uh, quite funny uh finding um yeah uh one of the more one of also one of the most important um uh research um parts for us was uh situation with the pastures and we were interested to know what are the main problems regarding pastures that uh, villagers, the communities see. And as you can see in this table, um, the majority they see uh, that there is too many animals grazing. There's not enough land um, and also high risk of predator attacks and that um, many respondents note that uh, pastures quality got worse. Um, some specific concern raised by, uh, by the respondents was that uh, the pastures are not regulated properly, um, that they are far uh, and the there are no roads, uh, and if there are roads, they're in bad conditions to the pastures. 
and the vehicles cannot reach them. And um, erosion, drought, uh, livestock diseases due to livestock brought from outside. Um, and many respondents noted the uh, border issues, um, for example, that pasture borders are not really uh, properly defined and livestock coming from Uzbekistan, for example, or from other districts. Um, yeah, last not but le uh, not least, we were um, curious to find out uh, what are like or, or what are the alternative um, economy opportunities present in the region. So one of our uh, questions in our survey was about tourism and uh, what is the tourism potential in the region, and uh, you can see that. Yeah, there is definitely a lot of tourism potential. And um, we asked uh, if the respondents have seen any tourists in their areas and if they have benefited from uh, providing at least one of the tourist activities, like maybe giving a taxi ride or giving a place to stay or just uh, providing uh, food and drinks to the tourists. So uh, overall around 41%, they said they have seen tourists in their areas in the last two years. And, uh, but only 18% they uh, benefited in any way from um, the tourist activities. And yeah, you can see that this, uh, uh, the percentage of people who saw tourists is lowest in Karakulja, which makes sense because it's the most remote uh, district that we have visited and the, there is basically the roads are uh, really in bad conditions. So uh, it shows that not many tourists visit that area, although it's really stunning. And in this picture, you can see um, the probably many of you have seen this uh, it's in Alai, uh, Sarimogu, the Lenin Peak, which is a very popular tourist destination in Osh Oblast. Yeah, and last but not least, um, we asked uh, our respondents about the future of snow leopards. So what are their concerns about the future of snow leopards? And um, many said they actually don't know uh, but also the majority, like many people have been saying that they need to, uh, we need to protect um, snow leopards. It's important for nature balance. It's beauty of nature, heritage of Kyrgyzstan. It's in the red book. Um, yeah, and actually very few have noted that it's important for ecology. Uh, it's important for biodiversity. Uh, it's in the top of the food chain. So it's, um, yeah, really very few cases that, uh, very few respondents that mentioned that. And yeah, just uh, in case you guys are interested, there is way more uh, finding star study and we have uh, made this uh, like uh, analysis, uh, a dashboard with the uh, results of our household survey report. And uh, in case you're interested, we can share the link uh, later and uh, you can just it's a bit more interactive you can see like uh, yeah some of the more details about uh, the findings so yeah just uh, wanted to mention that and feel free to give us feedback or if you have any questions contact us um, yeah so with all those findings with the analysis we moved to the final fourth part of our study, the seminars. Um, and Fatima is going to uh, tell you in more details about our uh, workshops. You're muted, Fatima. Thank you, Altenai. Thanks for sharing the, the survey results. Uh, following uh, survey analysis, uh, we went in March this year to do four seminars um, that were based off of the ARDI workshop methodology, which stands for Actors, Resources, Dynamics and Interactions. And Camp Alato helped us um, using this method to understand local knowledge, 
prioritize problems and come up with solutions to those problems. We shared our survey results um, with a group of from 15 to 20 people, um, the largest group being in Alai, which is the most populated district in Osh. And uh, so when we shared the results, um, it was no surprise for most of our participants. However, some of the responses we received was that they didn't know who the who rangers were, what they do, how many of them are there, and uh, there were no interactions between village communities and the rangers. Another thing that was interesting is a few teachers even mentioned that um, it would be great to have more uh, information, more maybe reading material, viewing material so that they could learn further about it. Some housewives expressed that um, they've never participated in seminars before because Southern North Kyrgyzstan vary in type of NGO activity um, that they receive. And majority of our participants also didn't know that they were living in snow leopard habitat. Um, so some of the takeaways from these seminars was that um, protect uh, one way of protecting ibex populations from decreasing is by improving a breed of livestock. Um, this means that the quality of the uh, sheep or goats uh, would increase and the quantity of which they have to keep the livestock will decrease, therefore um, decreasing the stress from the pastures. Uh, rangers from especially in Nukat and in Chungalai asked for better working conditions um, and to help to reintroduce marmots and wild boars um, to keep away wolf attacks from uh, herds, from um, livestock. Um, and one of the ideas is from Chongalai was to build four ranger huts, install camera traps to protect ibex populations from illegal hunting. They said that if we install camera traps, people would stay off the mountains, illegal hunters would stay off the mountains. In Alai, there was a, a goal to open a snow leopard learning center. This would enable uh, local youth and rangers to read camera trap data uh, and redirect illegal hunters to become rangers. So some of the exercises we did was picture yourself with um, you know, unlimited funds and picture 10 years into the future, what would you like to see? And this was the type of answers that we received. Uh, another idea was alternative economy through ecotourism and by selling local products uh, like dairy, sea buckthorn uh, grows very widely in Alai, uh, maybe creating some jams or honeys, uh, getting mountain uh, herbs to make herbal tea, using the wool to make carpets and other wool materials. Um, and the last idea we received was uh, building a bridge to direct livestock to hard to reach pastures instead of going upwards to Ibex territory. Um, for me, the seminar takeaway was that it's important to continue having seminars and continue building relationships and conversations with communities. And it's essential for them to be part of uh, decision making, especially when it comes to building capacity for conservation. Um, and because uh, ecological knowledge uh, that they hold is very valuable. And because not much NGO work has been done in Osh Oblast, building trust and uh, building these relationships became a key component of our approach to our work and the projects that we are continuing to do with them today. Um, 
And just to conclude with some challenges and opportunities, if we were to do this project all over again, uh, surveys were taken on paper. And I saw that there was a question in the chat, how long were, was the household survey questionnaire and how long do people uh, answer uh, these surveys? Um, thank you, Michaela, for your question. Household surveys were around three pages. Uh, they were three pages. First, they were two pages, then they became three pages. Um, usually, they would take from anywhere from 30 minutes, even to an hour uh, to answer these questions. And having 600 surveys on paper is a bit bulky. And there were times when it was snowing and we were going door to door. And yeah, paper naturally gets wet. I would say an opportunity for the future would be maybe using iPads just to save, you know, space because we also had, uh, we also carried big maps with us for the occupancy survey in case we encountered a ranger or, or a herder. Um, and then also iPads would save time on data entry as well. Um, Another challenge we faced was the type of surveying was not consistent and not all surveyors were doing it the same way. Um, and next time I would just spend more time on survey trainings and keep retraining them during the visit. Um, and the last challenge that I just wanna mention it was that the rangers we're working with in Osh Oblast are at a retirement age. And um, it seems that youth is not really interested in doing conservation work. Um, and I think an opportunity for this is um, maybe doing seminars in schools um, and creating more motivation, maybe uh, creating projects that would give motivation for youth in engaging in conservation work. Um, but overall, for me, I think the, the four stages of the project were really successful, especially uh, because we did an introductory visit, kind of introduced who we are, um, why we want to do this, uh, what their thoughts are, and how we can rephrase the questions. I think that was a really helpful tool before we went to um, do the longer 23-day trip with a bigger team. And the seminars also help to um, kind of bring all the ideas together, show the community back the information we've collected, and then um, use their information to build future projects. That's all from us. Thank you so much. And please uh, feel free to write any questions you have. We put our contact information um, there. And all the photos in the presentation were taken by our fellow surveyor, Azamat. And um, yeah, special thank you to him. Thanks, everyone. Yes, um, Flavia, I'm just going to share the link. Uh, There's another question from Flavia. Have you thought of linking any possible profits with community-based tourism and other resources as a scholarship for youth to engage and train in conservation? Would you like to answer that, Altenai, or would you like me to answer it? You can start. Um, there's always ideas flowing, especially when we visit. It always feels like, uh, there's so much that that could be that can be done. Um, tourism in Chongalai is not very prominent. I think touristic areas in Osh are usually in Alai because of Lenin Peak and Nukat, um, just because of the scenery mm -hmm. and there are CBTs. Um, that have been opened recently. Um, 
I just don't think that they make enough profit for us to use, uh, utilize funds to train youth. I think right now, interest is coming from Chongalai Ranger Jirgal uh, to create this kind of summer camp program to train 10 youth that he already uh, personally knows. Um, but other regions and other rangers in Osh Oblis have not shown as much interest in him as him. Um, I want to support him in this work. However, I don't think it can be done through community-based tourism. Yeah, I would just add that um, in general, we had, yeah, like Fatima said, so many ideas, like it's, especially during the seminar phase, like it's a lot of ideas flowing and like this education center, but the link with tourism, um, something that comes to mind is uh, on our most recent trip, um, we went uh, in Darot Korgon in uh, Tongalai and um, yeah, there's been this idea to um, have a coffee shop that maybe could uh, host um, some events uh, for uh, women and also for the youth, um, environmentally friendly, like to uh, put some like books on uh, wildlife, on environment there and have some, uh, some kinds of um, seminars uh, because uh, it's not as touristy as a lie. Chongalai, but still there is a lot of uh, international organizations coming there. There is a lot of, uh, yeah, that's that basically like we've been there already five times and every time uh, the guest house are pretty full with the uh, different international organizations. So we see there is opportunity to in this. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, and with that, we could also uh, like take this to involve more youth uh, in conservation. I see that Kenji is raising her hand. Yes, thank you Fatima Altana for the great presentations. It was really interesting uh, to hear you. the findings, project findings. Even I was involved in this project, but I didn't think that we have so many a nice result, yeah, so many findings from the project. Yeah, it was really interesting for me to find it out. And also, I love the idea that Fatima mentioned about uh, working more with sur surveyors, yeah. That is really, I support that idea. And uh, I would like to add that uh, probably uh, to involve surveyors, if it is possible, e during the designing the questions, because that will be more helpful and they will understand it from, you mm. know, from the beginning, because like and also making the question i mean questionnaire words uh, questions more simple yeah simplify as as simple as possible we we did last time right but anyway you know since they were not involved in uh, designing the questions uh, for the interviews yeah there were uh, probably there might be some kind of misunderstanding the questions even in any languages you know uh so yeah because we provided the questions in english uh, since they were able to speak english and also like in the local language as well right um yeah and also i'm i wanted to ask just how are you going to share the findings project findings with the local communities and stakeholders thanks thanks kenji uh yeah definitely this was one of our key, like one of the big learnings uh, for us during this study is that um, although we've made the introductory visit trip, although we've uh, tested the surveys and we had uh, one day of trainings with the surveyors, um, you cannot uh, underestimate, like overestimate this part. This part is so crucial, like the testing, the surveys, the uh, yeah, there are different surveys backgrounds, uh, different survey styles, and then uh, how it comes out in the data analysis, in the data entry part is that, uh, yeah, the styles, they do influence the, um, the data, especially we had some open questions as well in our surveys. So uh, from, like for me, I would definitely do even 
uh, like, like if there is enough time, if there is enough uh, resources, I think one week of testing and trainings with the surveyors is like, you cannot go wrong with that. You can only go better and uh, bullyproof your surveys and make sure that the um, level of the surveys is uh, similar. Um, yeah, but regarding sharing the results, uh, we've already shared uh, during our seminars, uh, we started off by uh, basically uh, sharing our findings with each of the uh, districts. So on each of the seminars, we have uh, showed the data we've collected. We have, uh, yeah, like basically used um, uh, the analysis to uh, basically uh, use the seminars to uh, show uh, people um, a bit like how uh, what we were able to find out. Um, yeah, how if we are going to share it uh, further? Um, yeah, there's also been a plan to. Uh, remember, there there was a question about uh, traditional knowledge and uh, if the communities, if the respondents, they remember any uh, snow leopard related uh, stories and maybe some um, uh, old traditions or um, yeah, tales. So, and Kenja, you have been helping us a lot on digitizing that uh, part. Yeah, there's still a plan uh, to make some booklets with that data. Um, yeah, but we didn't have time yet for that one. Um, Flavia had one more question. Can you talk more about the challenges you found related to coexistence with the wild, how they view them and the ways they deal with challenges? Uh, many conflicts, poaching. Thank you, Flavia, for your question. Um, there are many challenges in how locals view wildlife. Um, I think most of the concerns, especially from house, like from mothers and from women, were the safety of their children. Some of them in Karakul just said that they found a lynx or a bear, not a bear, a wolf uh, and jackals roaming inside the villages. So I think fear and psychological aspect um, of coexisting is a big concern. I think this is what leads people to ask hunters to go and do retaliatory uh, killings of these animals. And we found that through the seminars, um, on average, people didn't really understand the links between pastures and habitat loss of prey species of large carnivores. And once that, once that we kind of worked through understanding how this chain of events are linked together, um, their mindset towards, you know, killings and, um, coexistence with them shifted as well. Counting them is also not a priority for them. For example, how much uh, wolves have been killed or how much um, jackals have attacked, you know, how many chickens, because it just happens so often and it's just part of a regular, regular day life. Um, in terms of poaching, um, we did find evidence of a black market, uh, but we weren't able to go deeper on that just because it, it feels like it's very a targeted population that's doing that. And um, it doesn't seem like it's big, but we found that it exists. So I think that's really interesting. Any challenges with literacy and language found? To be honest, we didn't really check for their literacy or how much they read or write. I think on average, everybody has an elementary to middle school education. Maybe not everyone has a 
higher education, um, but everybody uses a smartphone and they stayed stay connected to administrative aspects of the village, decision making, and most people participate in decision making, even if it's through WhatsApp groups that they have with within inside the village. And we thought that was really interesting because like if we talk to the village head, the Ilokmotu head, he was able to, you know, put it in their WhatsApp group and it the information kind of spread that we were inside the village. Yeah, I think in terms of snow leopards, it seems like um, in Osh Oblast, most people don't know um, much about them. They don't. They didn't even know that they live close to them or within the habitat of snow leopards. They're very familiar with wolves and jackals, foxes, bears, uh, marmots, um, and and some birds like ular, uh, snowcock. But snow leopards, only minimal amount of people are familiar with them. Yeah, same thing in. I think all over Kyrgyzstan, really, uh, not only Osh Oblast. Yeah, I would say wolves and jackals uh, are the most disliked uh, predators. Yes. Did you guys have any problems with feral dog populations? Yes. Um, we had a question in our survey uh if they have yearly dog shootings in the villages um and maybe out of the 49 villages we visited one or two didn't have dog shootings every almost every village had uh, either yearly or uh, twice a year shooting of dogs to control their populations and feral dogs were a concern and also people were concerned that they're breeding with wolves or that they're breeding breeding with jackals and um yeah causing causing people fear biting them etc especially the ch um, another side of this uh mass shooting of the dog uh, the feral uh, dog shooting is the uh, possible psychological traumas for children we have uh heard many cases when children were trying to protect, to hide the dogs uh, when they heard there, were, uh, there was a dog shooting in their village. Are there challenges related to religion and dogs controlling in there? Also, are any partnerships with the local and federal governments? How is the relationship with the political environment? They're open. I would say um, a majority of the population um, is religious uh, in a way that um, yeah, they're uh, Muslim, we consider um, the main faith uh, Islam and uh, yeah, it, as you know, dogs, um, they're, they're not um, like it's with cats, it's a bit different story there, but uh, yeah, dogs uh, and religion, we didn't study, we didn't really um, focus on that, but in general, I would say dogs is not considered to be um, the a clean animal, I would say. Um, but uh, speaking of like uh, in general in Kyrgyzstan, um, if there are any partnership with local federal government, um, if you mean regarding the dogs population um, and the stray dogs, um, there has been in fact some trials of vaccinate, uh, not vaccinating, but um, what is it? The sterilizing. Sterilizing. Uh, the dogs by uh, the French foundation um, in order to like, they wanted to um, kind of show with data that economically, if you look in like 10, 20 year, like long-term period, economically, it makes much more sense to sterilize the dogs uh, 
um, in, instead of shooting them, because um, if you shoot them, of course, they, they have this adaptive mechanism, they uh, uh, give birth to even more dogs, so the population is not really declining because of the shooting. And uh, economically speaking, you spend even more money on uh, on the yeah on the shootings than uh, if you do the sterilizing campaigns. So hopefully, that's uh, going to be a start of the yeah some government initiatives in other regions too. So general wildlife the project. Of course, there's a lot of partnerships. I think this work, I mean, the Snow Leopard Network is an excellent platform for uh, building partnerships, for seeing what everybody else is doing in this field um, and working in Ally already one and a half years. Um, we've been able to see what has been done, who has been doing what, and um, what are the opportunities for the future. So following our project, we noticed that a ranger in, um, in Nukat, he was going around uh, with his own pocket money uh, to schools and doing educational seminars and workshops with youth. And um, we got an opportunity uh, with the Snow Leopard Network's training grant to support him in this work. And that kind of linked us to the Panji Foundation as well. And through this um, project, we were able to receive posters and booklets and calendars from NABU, from World Wildlife Funds, um, from OSCE to distribute in 30 um, schools in all over Osh Oblast. So I think this project created a great baseline for us to not only partner with local populations, but also uh, to see in which way we can work with various snow leopard and wildlife um, organizations, both international and local in Kyrgyzstan. And I would just like to add, um, in general, um, uh, basically the rangers, um, yeah, they work for government, right? And their salaries are just so low and they cannot even afford buying their own uniforms. And um, also the state is just, um, doesn't have um, like, resources uh, for protecting wildlife on the level that uh, it would be uh, needed. And in um, all of those districts, there are local associations. Um, they, uh, the local, um, for example, some wildlife activists, um, maybe uh, former hunters or um, ecologists, biologists, they form some kind of association, um, which is, private and but and they get uh, to for example the case in Chongalai our partners the Bekta Sod Foundation um, they get to um, monitor wildlife and do all the uh, environmental activities in for example uh, some area where they would like to increase ibex population so in that case uh, definitely like there are people, they don't get any support from the state. Um, they are all volunteers. However, um, as we've seen through the course of our work, um, there's so much interaction needed. There's so much um, involvement from the government, from the state rangers needed. And with our seminars, uh, especially uh, like just a few months ago, we've been doing the ranger seminars. We also try to create this kind of a platform, like a opportunity for them to understand how it is important to cooperate with each other and they all have to be a team in order to uh, yeah achieve their goals yeah this kind of people get creative I would say um, if you don't get support from the state then um, you have to find alternatives and uh, people also they these activists that these volunteers they try to um, like 
link it with some opportunities that they could possibly gain for it. For example, tourism. Um, yeah, there is like, um, or trophy hunting. Mm -hmm. Well, we just got one more question. Is there infrastructure for development of tourism? Um, if you mean by trails, trails exist. Um, if you mean by campsites, they do not. And there are hostels, and not hostels, there is guest houses um, where people usually stay when they come to Saramogul and when they come to Trongalai. Um, I would say those two areas and possibly a little bit in Nukat has a bit more infrastructure. But if you mean, for example, I, I tried to think through a project once where maybe we could do snow leopard photo hunting tours. And for those type of tourists, infrastructure doesn't exist because they require um, kind of a VIP experience. Um, they need they're usually elderly or like a little bit um, um, older in age and they can afford to have such a, a expensive tour. So they need like good sanitation facilities. They need a place to rest, um, to get warm. Uh, and then they also have very specific dietary requirements. Uh, maybe they wouldn't have that in, in Osh. And so just for a hiker, for a backpacker, infrastructure exists. There's trail maps, um, there, there are tour guides. One of our surveyors actually is a local tour guide there. Majority of our surveyors were from the tourism industry and they were very interested in doing something with tourism in the area just because of the beautiful landscapes. But in building this more higher end, tourism infrastructure, there's still a long way to go. Yeah, I would say it's just starting uh, in the South, the development of tourism, because uh, Kyrgyzstan, like for international tourism um, and the flight connections are mostly through Bishkek, right? So like you need to either fly to Oshden in order to explore the South. So which makes it uh, less uh, attractive for tourists uh, to go uh, to the south because there is also, of course, like stunning nature in the north. But I would say uh, from like the feeling from what we've seen, like there are more and more tourism um, developing in the area, more CBTs, uh, the uh, internet, uh, the OSH, destination OSH, uh, is hosting, uh, is helping a lot, uh, renting the equipment. So like they always have uh, a lot of uh, demand uh, from tourists, um, organizing tourist conferences and partnering with uh, other uh, stakeholders in the tourism. So yeah, that's kind of just baby steps basically, but hopefully, um, yeah, it's hopefully it's gonna, um, receive more attention. Our last question was, how big is this no leopard population there? Um, already any ideas? <laughs> this is a really funny question to us. <laughs> Tricky question. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, it's really so hard to say. And like we said, um, the this um, our colleague Shannon, um, he's working exactly on that. So I don't want to. I don't know if you have a feeling, Fatima. I think the answer is I don't know. That's the <laughs> safest answer. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for your questions. That was really enjoyable. And thank you, SLN, for inviting us to be here and for this opportunity to see our work. So feel free to ask us any questions that come up maybe later in the day, in the week, send us an email. 
Uh, we're always happy to share more, especially about the work we're doing now. Yeah, and we're happy to connect in general. So thanks everyone for joining, for being active, for staying till the end. And thanks a lot, SNL, for this opportunity and for the organization, Rahi, Madina. Thank you so much, Fatima and Altanai. And um, if anyone does want to get in touch with either of them, please feel free to email me and I can put you in contact. Thank you all once again. Thank you.